everyone. I'm Ryan Larrison and I'm the laboratory director of the Michigan State Police Bridgeport Forensic Science Laboratory. I'd like to invite you today to come in and take a look at the six different units or scientific disciplines that exist at the Bridgeport Laboratory and you'll be able to meet some of the scientists and hear their backgrounds and see what they do. The Bridgeport Laboratory is divided into several different units by discipline. Each scientist has their own discipline that they practice in. Those scientists do casework on a daily basis for all the sub-disciplines and disciplines within that unit. The only unit that the Bridgeport Laboratory does not have is a DNA unit. DNA is currently serviced by the Lansing Grand Rapids and Northville laboratories of the Michigan State Police. So any biological evidence that is initially processed at the Bridgeport lab will then go down to one of those labs to be processed for actual DNA results. The Michigan State Police Bridgeport Laboratory, like all other seven laboratories in the system, are accredited laboratories. They're accredited to ISO 17025 standards as a testing laboratory by the ASCLAD lab organization. And that's a really important part of the work that's done. Accreditation shows that you're committed to quality and that you're committed to doing what you say you're doing. This unit that you're seeing right now is the evidence intake unit. Evidence intake is where the chain of custody starts for any given discipline. So when the evidence comes in, it's brought in by a police officer, it's sealed, and it's in a certain type of packaging depending on the evidence. The intake personnel will then enter the, the data into the system for each case and catalog the evidence, and that begins the chain of custody for that evidence. The chain of custody is basically a uh, unbroken chain or link from the start to finish until it leaves the lab for that evidence. It shows everywhere that the evidence has gone in the laboratory, who has touched it, who has done work with it, and then when it's released back to the police agency. That way we maintain that evidence in a professional manner, showing that it's free from harm and contamination. My name is Jerome Walder and I work here in the drug uh, analysis unit here at the Bridgeport lab. And what I'm looking at here is a suspected item, uh, suspected cocaine. Um, I've done a purification process, or also known as an extraction in the other room, and I'm looking to see um, if this is in fact cocaine. Uh, so the first thing I did is I ran a background uh, subtraction on our instrument. It takes out all the uh, background interference from our spectra. Uh, here I've entered in our laboratory number and uh, identifiers for this sample. And um, just going to note here uh, what this is. It's an extracted, um, extracted uh, white material residue. Um, now what I'll do is uh, take a small portion of my sample here. Just take a little bit out of this mortar and place it on the top plate of the instrument. Right in the center of this top plate there's a, a diamond. What we do is we place a sample over that then we uh, apply pressure with this anvil. What that does is squeeze out any air that uh, might be present and gets good contact uh, between your sample and the crystal. Uh, so I'll start my data collection and what I try to do is get about uh, 70 newtons of pressure and um, this gives an auto, uh, immediate read back to the computer so I can see what the spectra looks like and I can kind of do a quick review of it before I start the scan uh, just to make sure that um, everything looks good. So I'll, I'll go ahead and collect this data now. So what's happening now is the instrument's passing infrared light uh, from the back of the instrument. It's coming up through a bunch of mirrors being reflected off mirrors, and then it's hitting our sample. And then, the re and then when the IR hits the sample, it causes a different 
bonds within the molecule to react in different ways. So that information gets sent back to the detector and then it's, um, it comes up on our screen here. You can see this is the result of our, uh, this is what the graph would look like. Has different uh, nanometers of light across the bottom here. That's just, uh, you can also think of that as different colors of light, different wavelengths. And so at each wavelength that's giving me a response uh, and percent transmittance. So here it's all being transmitted and here's part of it's being absorbed so you get a, you get a peak. Uh, here uh, almost all of it's absorbed. Uh, but this is basically a fingerprint for our compound here. And I've seen this fingerprint many times so I can tell you right now it's cocaine base. But we also have a library on here we can search. So it searches through the library that we've built using our own standards that we purchased from chemical companies um, in the United States. Uh, the, the, I guess the standards get sent to us and then we build our own library here at the lab. So um, here I'll show you a comparison. So on, on the top here is our sample, our unknown sample, and the bottom here is our sample that we've entered into our library. So we just go through this peak by peak, make sure that all the peaks are there and um, that nothing's missing. There's no extra peaks or any distortions. And then we, we're uh, able to call it cocaine base. This is, my, uh, this is our gas chromatograph, and here you can see our auto sampler. What's really nice about this instrument is we don't have to be present here for it to make injections. So we have a tray here. Each tray is numbered with a diff uh, has a different number, so it uh, goes from 1 to 14, and then uh, 15 to 28 and so forth and in our program we can tell this um, auto sampler here where to take its sample from so we can load this thing up and run it all night if we want without having to be here and we can come in the next morning and look at our data uh, basically the way this instrument works is uh, we have an unknown sample that we've gotten from a police agency um, and we run it against a known standard so for instance, if I had cocaine in this case, I would take my unknown sample that I suspect may be cocaine and run it against a cocaine standard. Uh, the substance injected in the instrument here, and this is an oven, basically. Um, it goes through a very small straw. You can think of it as a straw that's about 15 meters long. It's all wrapped around in here. Um, it's, it's a very small diameter. The substance travels through there. As it travels through any kind of if your cocaine's mixed with any kind of uh, cutting agents or other impurities, it'll separate those out by, in the process of moving through this uh, column. All of your molecules react differently with the substrate, so it causes them to separate into their individual components. Um, and then our detector here is a flame detector. You can't see it, it's inside here, but uh, the flame detects the substances as they leave the machine and it gives you a time that it took from when it was injected to when it hits the detector. So what we do is we make sure that the cocaine's time on the cocaine standard matches up with our un unknown sample. If it doesn't, then we know that it's something other than the cocaine, but if it matches up, then we know that it's cocaine. Hi, my name is Elaine Doherty, and I'm a forensic scientist here at the Bridgeport Laboratory. I've worked in the Controlled Substances Unit for about 11 and a half years now, and for the past nine months or so, I've been the supervisor of the unit. Uh, because of the area we live in, we see a wide variety of different drugs here in this unit. We cover uh, two large urban areas, Saginaw and Flint, but we also cover a lot of rural areas. We really see different drugs depending on uh, where uh, those drugs are coming from. Uh, for example, in the city of Saginaw and in the city of Flint, we see a lot of uh, what we would call big city drugs, things like um, heroin and cocaine, where in the more rural areas, we see some um, a, a kind of a different selection of drugs, a lot more prescription drugs, some of the more unusual drugs, and um, also some of the designer drugs, the newer drugs that are coming onto the market these days. Right now, we get about 35% uh, of our cases as uh, marijuana cases, about 15% or so are cocaine, and about 10% are heroin. Uh, I would say probably 15 to 20% are prescription pills, and then the rest is made up of just a variety of different drugs. 
A few trends we've seen in this area lately are a decrease in the amount of cocaine cases. Uh, probably about six or seven years ago, about 30% of our cases were cocaine, and now it's down to about half of that. Uh, when I started here, we, ha we had far less than 1% of our cases as heroin. Now we're up to 10%. And also prescription pills have increased tremendously during that period of time. Some of the new drugs that we're seeing, kind of, they fall more or less into two categories. One is the bath salt type of drugs, which they've been around for about four years or so. Those are typically stimulant drugs. And when you take them, they'll make your heart race. And uh, some of them also may make you hallucinate. Um, they have some kind of uh, interesting names like alpha PVP and uh, MDPV and uh, some of the street names, uh, something like Flocka or um, just other kind of uh, more creative names that really have nothing to do with what the substance is. The other group of drugs that we're seeing are called synthetic cannabinoids, and those are typically in smoked products uh, called K2 or Spice. We haven't seen many of those lately, but we uh, do see them occasionally still, and uh, there's still uh, new drugs in that group are still coming out all the time. In fact, uh, just last week we saw a new drug in that category of synthetic cannabinoids. My background is actually in the field of biochemistry. I have a biochemistry degree from Michigan Technological University. From there I actually went and taught high school chemistry for five years. Uh, after five years I was really looking for something else to do so I decided to look into what does it take to be a forensic scientist. And what I found is that I, I had the appropriate degree, you know, a science degree, chemistry, biology, something like that. And really all I needed was a way to get my foot in the door. And in this field, one of the great ways to get your foot in the door is to have an internship. So I actually uh, re registered for graduate school at Michigan State University in their forensic chemistry program. And along with that, I was offered an internship at our Lansing Forensic Laboratory. I worked in the Lansing Forensic Laboratory in the Trace Evidence Unit for about a year, and then I was hired for a controlled substances position here at the Bridgeport Laboratory. Uh, I ended up uh, leaving graduate school after three semesters just because my ultimate goal was to get a job, and I was offered one. Uh, a strong science background is critical in this job, and one of the biggest factors is really having um, a natural curiosity for things. When you see something that might be a little bit unusual or something different, just wanting to figure out what is that, why is it there, uh, what more can I say to the investigating officers to help them uh, figure out their case and figure out what's going on, what these people are doing, if, it, if it's something that's a little bit more unusual. Ultimately, we are analytical chemists. We get an unknown substance and we have to figure out whether or not the substance that's there is controlled. Sometimes it's very, very easy if we have a common drug. Sometimes it's very hard, and it can be hard on two different levels. One, it might be hard to actually get the substance out of the material. For example, we're getting uh, quite a few food products lately, and actually trying to get the uh, drug out of the food product can be a challenge in order to identify what it actually is. The other part that can be challenging once you have a substance is trying to find out what it is. The drug world is changing virtually every day and so we may actually find something in a white powder or in a food product, something like that, that we've never seen before, that we don't have any references for and we'll actually have to do some investigation and try to find out what it is. A lot of times we end up talking to colleagues in other states, uh, colleagues with the DEA, trying to figure out what in fact that substance is so that we can then assist the agency in determining whether or not it's controlled. There are two critical factors when handling evidence. One of them is contamination. Because we are basically in charge of whether someone is going to be charged criminally with something, we have to make sure that we don't get a substance from one case into substance from another case. It's very, very important to make sure that if you get anything on yourself, you don't transfer it into another case. And this isn't just true in the drug unit, this is true throughout the whole uh, laboratory. For that reason, uh, to make sure that we have no cross-contamination, we do a lot of making sure surfaces are clean. We use brand new glassware, we use brand new pipettes, we use new um, 
new substances or new uh, glassware whenever we can. And in addition to that, it's just making sure that you don't, it's, it's very simple laboratory techniques. If you uh, touch something to a sample, you make sure you don't use that item again somewhere else. So for example, if you have a pipette and you're removing a sample of a liquid, make sure you throw that pipette away and you don't use it in your next case. The other thing that we have to be concerned about when handling cases is our personal safety. Some of these substances can be very harmful if they're inhaled or ingested. And so we have to make sure that those substances don't get into our body and actually hurt us. So we have to make sure that we wear gloves when touching certain things, and we have to uh, work in the hood if necessary to make sure that we don't inhale some of the product. The most dangerous things to handle are things that are very fine powders, uh, liquids, and then there are certain drugs that can actually be absorbed through the skin, like LSD. So if we think we have something like that, we have to be extremely cautious when handling it so that we ourselves aren't injured by the drug. My name is Lisa Sharko. I'm currently a biologist at the Bridgeport Forensic Laboratory. I've been here for about two and a half years and I've been released to do casework for about a year. Um, my background is a major in biology, minoring in chemistry from Saginaw Valley State University. Um, while I was in college, I completed an internship through the laboratory, which is how I knew that this is what I wanted to get into. So after I graduated from college, I did some contracting work for the Dow Chemical Company, and when a position opened at the laboratory, I applied and I uh, got the job. So um, today, I'm just going to go through processing a sample and show you all the different techniques that I have to do, um, prevention of contamination. Uh, the particular sample is a possible blood stain. So to start, I have to bleach down my bench to prevent contamination from case to case. For every case, I have a piece of white bench sheet paper that I put down and just a regular piece of paper. We have to wear full PPE, so I have a face mask, a lab coat, and gloves that I always wear when I'm handling any sort of sample. technology has become extremely sensitive so we take all the precautions that we can uh, to prevent contamination so there are certain things um, everything here in the spin table I only handle with gloves I never touch it with my bare hands whereas everything over here I touch with my bare hands and not gloves This is quite frequently how we uh, receive blood swabs. There's a little dust can at the bottom to prevent mold growth. So I'm just going to take a small cutting from the swab and test it for the possible presence of blood. So this test is called phenethylene. Um, it's a two-part test. It is an oxidation reduction reaction and it detects the possible presence of blood. It doesn't differentiate between human and animal blood and it can also react with a couple of other things such as um, metals, rust. So I'm going to add my first chemical followed by my second and if a pink color change appears then it's possible for the possible presence of blood which you can see that nice bright pink color there. So from there, I'm gonna do an additional test to show that this is the presence of human blood because the presumptive test doesn't differentiate between human and animal. So 
So the test to determine if it's human blood is called hematrace. It kind of resembles a pregnancy test. It's a small cartridge. I'm going to um, elute my sample out with some buffer and then I'm going to add it to this testing well and it's going to migrate up the testing strip. I'm just going to mix it up to ensure that it is dispersed. So in, court, in order to call this test positive, I can call it positive whenever the testing line appears. However, in order to call it negative, I have to wait a full 10 minutes. So I always write down 10 minutes from my start time. have to mark all the evidence with the lab number and the initials. Um, I have to mark all the evidence with the lab number and initials and my initials um, in case I ever have to testify in court to the case. Um, generally, the prosecutor will ask, do you recognize this evidence? If so, how? And by putting my initials, I know that I've worked with the sample. So it's been about a minute, and I can already tell that this sample is positive. Um, the longer I wait, the better the line will develop. Um, you can see, so I put my sample in here. It's migrated up the testing strip. A line will always appear in the control area to show that the test is working properly. Um, at the test window, a line will appear if human blood is present. So right now the line is kind of faint, but it will develop more throughout the 10 minute period. However, at this point, I'm comfortable calling it positive. So I'm gonna get the swab back out. I'm going to change my gloves. Uh, so I am going to cut all of the swab and package it appropriately for DNA testing so that when the DNA lab gets our sample, they're not getting all of the swab. They're getting just the extraction tube with the cutting that we've put in there. We do have um, control samples so that when we test our chemicals, we know that they are properly working. So in this case, I've got a known blood stain. I'm just going to take a small cutting of it. my phenothaline, which is the um, presumptive test for the possible presence of blood. And this is a, a QA, QC, quality assurance, quality control to show that my chemicals are functioning properly. So I'm going to do a positive and a negative. My first chemical, followed by my second. And you can see in the positive area, there's that nice bright pink color change, which ensures that my chemicals are working properly. In the negative, there's no color change. So that's a good thing. So it's very, it's very important that we quality assure and quality control our chemicals every day um, for court purposes. Uh, when we get to court and we're testifying to the different procedures and techniques that we completed, the prosecutors and the defense attorneys want to know that our chemicals are functioning properly. Because if they aren't functioning properly, then um, that would not be good for us. I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> uh, poor, it would be, 
if our chemicals weren't functioning properly, it would be um, poor laboratory standards, and it's important to maintain that high quality of assurance in the laboratory setting. Okay, so I've created a small plastic package for my extraction tube. I'm gonna put the date and again, my initials on the seal. Um, properly sealing evidence is important for the chain of custody so that we know where evidence has been, when it was in my personal custody, um, when I transferred it out of my custody. Um, and that's good to know so that you know where the evidence has always been, especially for court pr processes. So once I get the DNA tube in a small extraction tube like this, I'm going to put it in a DNA envelope, which is what's going to go to Lansing. So I'm going to put that in there along with my other DNA labels. And at this point, I can take my gloves off and my mask. And I'm, I can handle this label with my hands because it's not going um, on the tube or in the envelope. It's just on the exterior of the envelope so that the DNA analyst in Lansing knows what they have. I'm just going to seal up the original swab again with evidence tape and my initials and date on the seal. And I'll use a marker that I handle with my bare hands instead of these ones that I only handle with gloves. Um, on the DNA envelope, I put a small sticker and it just has um, different guidelines and codes for how you have to properly store the envelope so that when the agency gets the envelope back, they know how to handle it. Um, seal up the envelope. My name is Carrie Holka. I'm a forensic scientist here at the Bridgeport Lab. I work in the latent print unit. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in science with a major in biology and a bachelor of arts with a major in criminal justice and minor in chemistry. Uh, the, I started my career here at the lab first as an intern. Uh, that kind of got my foot in the door and um, I was then hired on as a technician in the firearms unit and then came on board here in the latent print unit as a forensic scientist. Um, I'm going to talk about what a fingerprint is first. Um, between the uh, end of the first trimester, beginning of the second trimester of fetal life, your fingerprints are formed. Um, and your fingerprints are comprised of raised areas of skin known as ridges. And these areas form unique patterns and unique characteristics. And those make up your fingerprints. So when you touch something, there's a chance that you could leave an impression of those ridges on whatever it is that you touch. Uh, when we're looking at evidence here at the lab, uh, we try to develop those fingerprints to make them visible so that we can do our comparisons. Um, depending on the type of evidence we have, we will first start out looking at it to see if we can see anything with our uh, naked eye. And if not, we then go on to another type of chemical processing um, or with powders or things like that. Uh, right here behind us is a super glue tank and it's called cyanoacrylate fuming and it's a, basically the technical term for super glue, which is your standard household super glue. Uh, we heat the super glue up and combined with a certain amount of humidity that super glue will vaporize and adhere to any moisture that is on the evidence inside, including your fingerprints. Uh, we have some evidence here in, in the super glue tank and what I'm going to do is take that out and then I will spray it with a dye stain. So 
So after the, the evidence has been fumed, um, we basically just cover it with this, the chemical. and allow it to evaporate. And once the uh, dye stain on there has evaporated and um, dried, we will then take it to an alternate light source where we will look at it under a certain wavelength of light. And if any fingerprints or latent prints are on that item, we'll be able to visually see them. They'll be fluoresce. Uh, this is taking a little bit longer to dry because it's from a controlled substances case. And sometimes some of the items that we receive uh, from these types of cases will inhibit the chemical from evaporating as quickly as it would on other pieces of evidence. Okay, uh, once the dye stain has uh, completely dried, I will then look at it underneath an alternate light source under a designated wavelength to see if any of the fingerprints will develop. And if there are any on here that I can use in my comparison that have enough value to them, I can then photograph those prints and our computer here, um, we can pull up the images on there and then calibrate it so that the image that I take is at a one-to-one -one level to the known impressions to which I will compare them to. And known impressions are uh, basically when someone gets uh, fingerprinted, whether it be for a job or uh, a background check or when they um, are arrested, those are known impressions. Somebody knows who took those impressions and whose fingers those were. So I'll take any latent prints that I see on here and compare what I see to a set of known impressions. Okay. All right, so I'm going to turn the light off and put on these orange goggles and look at this evidence underneath a certain wavelength of light. So as I'm looking at this evidence under the light, I'm looking for any kind of uh, ridge structure, which are ridge structure are, like I talked about earlier, the ridge, ridge skin on your hands. I'm looking to see if I see any, anything that might be of value for a comparison. And there is something that I see, so I'm going to mark that so that I know uh, where that is located on this piece of evidence, and then I'll set it up on the camera. Okay, so this step is done, and then we're going to move to the camera portion. I'm going to get that set up. Okay, so when we uh, capture a latent print, we always have to have information within the picture as to what it is, a uh, lab number. Whenever evidence is submitted to the lab here, it receives a designated number associated with that case. The police agency will have their own number associated with that evidence, but we give it another number called the lab number um, so that we know what case that evidence belongs to. So. In this case, this is a digital scale, and there's a latent print on it, so I'm going to take a picture of it. But within that picture, I'm going to um, write down on, on a scale the lab number, so the case it's associated with, uh, my initials, and then the date and what the item number is. And the item number is just, uh, you might have a case that has 12 different things, and each thing will give it another separate number, just so that you know, okay, item number one is the digital scale, or you know, item number two is so on and so forth, so that later on when I'm looking at the different photographs, I know which piece of evidence I'm looking at.
Alright, so I have my camera all set up and it's ready to go for me to take a picture. So, um, our computer system controls the camera. So, I'm shooting it from over here and in a minute you'll see an image pop up. Um, it has my information on there as well as the latent print. Um, sometimes we have to play with the settings on our camera a little bit, so that one was a little bit dark, so I'm going to try to lighten it up. Okay, so right here is the end of the scale, and that was what I was looking at um, with my magnifier. And so that's the image that I'm going to use for my comparison later on. Um, after I have my image captured, there's another program that we use and that will allow me to pull up the image and to make any adjustments that I need to. The contrast might be a little bit off. Um, I'm going to change it to black and white so that you won't see that green color. Um, and then I will use that image to make my comparison. So I type in any case information that I have, what type of a case it is, check that the lab number, So that image is importing and once it's imported we'll be able to do whatever it is we need to do. Okay, the first thing that we always do, I had mentioned earlier, we like to do our comparisons on a one-to-one. -one. So that means that I w when I look at the known impressions, they're going to be the normal size of that person's finger. I don't want to compare that smaller size to a big blown up image so I'm going to make this image the same size as that person's finger would have been. So I just use my scale and I'm going to calibrate it or make it the real life size. From there, I'll take it over to Photoshop, and like I said, if there's anything, any adjustments I want to make with the contrast or making it black and white, that's where we'll do that. So here I'm just taking the color out, making it black and white or grayscale. And then the part that I am interested in, oh, is right here. So I don't really need to adjust the color or anything else. I'm just going to focus on that part. I'm just adjusting the contrast so that when I do my comparison, it'll be easier for me to see. Okay, and I'm happy with how that looks. So I'm just going to save it. I'll print that out. We're in another part of the latent print unit here. Um, once we have a finger, a latent print that we want to compare to known impressions, we'll come in here and we have access to the um, archive system that has 
that, which is a database that has all known impressions in it from people who have been, as I mentioned earlier, um, perhaps arrested if they were um, checked, did a background check or if they applied for you know, a certain job or a school, whatever they need to be fingerprinted for, their, pr their prints will go into our system. And we can then pull a copy of those uh, known impressions that we need. So uh, I'm simply going to enter the number of a person it's called the SID number. Every time someone's fingerprinted, each person is designated with a SID number, a state ID number. So that number I will enter into the system and pull up known finger or palm impressions if I need them. Uh, on this computer system, we also have access to APHIS, which is an, our automated fingerprint identification system. And that is a system made up of not only the known impressions, but any um, latent fingerprint impressions um, that we don't know who they belong to as of yet. If I cannot identify this person, and I know that it was not them who made this impression, then I will use this system, and this is our APHIS system. And I'll give you guys an idea of how that works. So you can see this is the uh, print that we had on the digital scale. And what I will do from here on out, um, I'm going to be marking the unique characteristics that are a part of this fingerprint or this latent print. So you can see on here, um, this ridge, this line that you see is called the ridge. And it comes down and it splits into two. So that's called a bifurcation, when one like forks into two like a fork in the road. So that is unique. So I'm going to mark that area. Um, this ridge right here is very small. Um, and it comes up and it stops. So that's called a ridge ending. That is also an area that I'm going to mark because that is unique. So I will keep on going through this process, looking at every single ridge, where they stop, where they start, and looking at any unique characteristics. Um, from that point on, I will put it into our system. And uh, once that's in the system, the system will look for any, any matches that it thinks that that fingerprint could be any known impressions. So this is one that I had done earlier. Um, earlier I had mentioned that fingerprints um, could be made up of different patterns. So the example on the right here, that's a loop pattern. It comes up and it comes back down. This right here is a, called a double loop whirl pattern. So you can see it kind of loops around and it comes back up. So those are two different patterns. I know right then and there that that's not the same person. But this is an ex just an example, like I said, of what it would look like once I put that unknown print from our scale into the system. It would give me a list of potential matches, and then I would go through and look at them and see what you know which one it could possibly be. If they are close, if it's the same pattern, then I will look further. I'll look at the characteristics, at the ridge endings, and at the bifurcations, and so on and so forth. To and if we have a potential match, I will then um, print off that individual's known print, known print cards, their known impressions, and I will compare that latent print um, using small magnifiers with my naked eye and make the comparison to see if, that, if it is that person, if I, if I can identify them. Hello, welcome to the Microtrace unit at the Bridgeport Crime Lab. My name is David Beachigo, and I work in the trace unit, also supervise uh, the biology and QD units. And um, in the trace unit, we have various uh, different specialties. In fact, the trace unit has the largest 
group of subdisciplines within any discipline in the laboratory system. So in the Bridgeport lab, we do footwear and tire track comparisons where we will um, take a question impression from a crime scene and compare it to a known impression um, from a suspect or from a suspect's vehicle. Um, we also do investigative information for agencies if they don't have any suspects to determine what kind of vehicle it might have been or what type of shoe might have been you were worn by the suspect. Um, and then we also do physical matches where if some object is broken in the commission of a crime and part of it's found on a suspect and the other part's found um, at the crime scene, we can match them together and see if they were at one time one single object. We also do arson analysis in the Bridgeport Laboratory. That's where we're looking for any flammable or combustible liquids that might have been used to start a fire. So I have some examples of what we do and how we do it that I can show you. If an agency is investigating, a, a, say, a B&E somewhere, and a vehicle was used to haul stuff away from the crime scene, they may get what are called tri tire tracks um, left behind. And depending on whether they're in soil or whether they're um, on pavement, if they can measure the stance of those tire tracks, we can try and tell them what type of vehicle might have left the tire tracks behind. So I may get a phone call from an agency who will give me a series of measurements um, that I can use to search a database which we use. So we use these measurements to search a database and we currently are using a database it's called the Canadian Vehicle Specification Database. It's used primarily by accident reconstructionists throughout the, uh, Canada but because it also allows us to search the uh, stances of vehicles it's been a good resource for us to use for in investigators to find out what type of vehicle they might have. So I receive a set of measurements. Outside to outside would be from the outside of one tire track to the outside of the other tire track. Inside to inside would be from the inside of the tire track to the inside. And we have them do the inside to outside and the opposite outside to inside. And then we have them get a wheelbase if they can and then the tire width. So what I'll do is put it in the database and I will search a range of measurements. I'll start out with just the front stance because it's often hard to tell whether the tire tracks were left by the front or the rear of the vehicle. So the first search I do is um, the front track. So I'll enter a range of 64 inches, other way around, 63 inches, to 64 inches, run the search, and it's going to give me a list of vehicles. Now this list of vehicles is going to be very, fairly large because a lot of vehicles have a stance between 63 and 64 inches. And you can see we have pickup trucks, um, some SUVs, we actually have some sedans, we have some uh, vans. So now what we want to do is try and narrow it down for the agency because that's on a huge list. We will still give that list to them, but we want to narrow it down. So next search I'll do is to add the rear stance to it. And this has narrowed down our search from 1,000-some vehicles to 329. So now we have gotten rid of a lot of the vans and primarily have SUVs and some sedans, Camaros, and then some SUVs and Highlanders, um, and again, some pickup trucks. So they got me a wheelbase, 132 inches approximately, which is a fairly large wheelbase. So we're going to enter that in there. We'll do 131 to 133. Oops. And this will narrow the search down 
and we come down to 28 vehicles. So based on that, it looks like a possibly a pickup truck, Chevy Dodge pickup truck. So I asked if they had a picture of the tire track so I could see what type of tire it was. Is it really from a truck or could it be from a passenger vehicle? So I have that photograph when I can show you how I search and determine what type of tire that might be. Okay, so we're now in the scope room and uh, footwear computer room in the laboratory where we have uh, several different uh, functions in here. We have our image enhancement or um, footwear computer where we print all our photographs because all our digital images from crime scenes are digital as opposed to the old days when we had film. So all, everything comes on a CD or on a memory card. So we have to use a computer to process those images and print them out. So we have a computer over here for which we do that. Now on a tire track case, they told you they sent me a picture of the tire track from the scene and from where those stances were measured. Um, this particular tire, um, I searched the database and the database we use is um, called Tread Design Guide. The um, Tread Design Guide books are what we get uh, to look for tire tread designs and try and match them up. We have uh, books, if you uh, can pan over to the uh, cabinet there, going all the way back to 1971. And those have tire designs that have been made uh, for all those years. And um, we've used, used those to look for the patterns. So the process is manual. It's broken into sections. We have passenger tires. Small highway and light truck tires. To medium and heavy truck tires. So what you do is just start at the beginning and look at the pattern in your question impression and compare looking for these lugs. In this particular case, the center rib, because this is about half of the impression, the center rib has what I'd characterize as a bow tie shaped element or two hexagons butted together. And I saw that in a couple different brand tires, but didn't see these um, kind of J-shaped elements with them. So I did a search on Google of one of the brands, which was um, BF Goodrich, had this center element. And found a BF Goodrich tire that indeed did have the bow tie shaped or two hexagons butted together in the middle. But I noted that the outside element didn't look like that J. It had a groove in between. But I also noted that groove was very shallow. So then I decided to search the web one more time and I found a used tire site and on there, they had a used tire where it had been worn down past that shallow groove, and now that element does look like the J shape any other. So I determined that this BF Goodrich uh, rugged trail tire was possibly the tire that left the impression. One brand, there may be others out there with the same design, but it's the one I came across. So with that information, that tells the investigator that between my stance search and the tire that he most likely has a truck type vehicle. Could be a large SUV, pickup truck, something of that nature. Okay, so now we also can search for known shoes. If we get an impression from a crime scene and we don't know uh, the suspect, but the agency wants to know what type of shoe might have left the impression in case they get a suspect, we can search a database called uh, the Shoe Print Image and Capture Retrieval System. Their database is called Soulmate. And we use this program 
to try and identify what make or model shoe could have left the impression. On the right hand side you will see a impression in dirt that has some rectangular bars and some rectangular bars with little notches out of it. I enter a coating over here for those elements and then I hit search and then we get a, a, a panel of candidate shoes that come up and the third one that came up appears to have the same design. And you can see we have the series of rectangles down the middle, the rectangles with the notches out of down the sides, and the heel elements that are rectangles. So this shoe uh, happens to be a Nike boot. And so that information was, will be provided to the agency to tell them you're one of your suspects who's wearing a Nike boot. Again, we caution them. There may be other makes and models out there with the same design because there are knockoffs out there. There are companies that steal designs from other footwear companies. Um, we have one particular pattern which is fairly popular, the Nike Air Force One, but it's also found on a British Knights, found on an IC brand. Um, it's found on several other brands. Um, so you have to be careful, you have to caution your investigators all the time. Also had another impression on that same scene. which I entered and coded in also a series of circles, some bars up in the toe, and some concentric rings down here. And these small concentric rings were within these circles. I can then search that impression And the first shoe on the list, this time, is a Nike Shock that matches the scene impression. So that scene impression, someone was wearing a Nike Shock shoe or another shoe that might have the same pattern. As I mentioned earlier, another f job function we do is called physical match. Um, this is where two items may have been broken in a commission of crime. One item was found at the crime scene and one at, uh, in the suspect's possession. I have now on a microscope, and we use a series of different kinds of microscopes in the laboratory. This happens to be a stereo microscope. And I have the um, two pieces underneath the scope. And the big piece on the left was found in a suspect's possession. The small piece on the right, which I can carefully remove it here, was found at the crime scene. So they wanted to know, could they have been from the same source? Well, the first thing is, do they, are they made of similar material than they appear to be? So then I look to see, do they fit in? It's almost like doing a puzzle, very much like doing a puzzle. We put the piece in there, and then we use uh, the stereoscope to look at the features and see that the break is the same and they fit together. And then we can use this stereoscope with the computer to also photograph and document that physical break and physical match. So at one time, those were two piece, pieces were one item. So that helps them connect the suspect to the crime scene. Another function here at the Bridgeport Trace Unit is to analyze fire debris evidence. Uh, an agency will collect the evidence in nylon bags and seal them up and the nylon bags prevent any possible combustible flammable liquid from escaping the debris so that we can test and see if there was any present. 
when it comes into the laboratory the bags get a carbon strip added to them and sealed back up and placed into the to a large oven at 80 degrees centigrade they're in there for about four hours and that charcoal strip will absorb any flammable or combustible or any hydrocarbon in that fire debris sample. After four hours the samples are removed and the carbon strip is taken out and the carbon strip is placed inside one of these tiny vials. Um, then that tiny vial gets some carbon disulfide which strips the flammable combustible or other hydrocarbon products off that charcoal strip into the liquid and then the liquid is injected into our GC mass spec. The GC mass spec will then separate the elements or compounds in that sample by boiling point and the affinity to the column. It's a long thin column if you think of a garden hose but very very thin that those the liquid is going through and as it separates it comes into the mass detector and it gets bombarded and split into its fragments. That is then measured and printed on a screen in a, what's called a chromat chrom gas chromatogram. That gas chromatogram shows a series of peaks of the different elements. What you see on the screen here is a standard we call an alkane standard which is made up of the different straight chain hydrocarbons. You start with C8 going all the way up to C22 and that's just a straight chain of carbons with hydrogens on them. No alcohols, no, no um, other compounds to it. It's just a straight chain hydrocarbon. A lot of our flammable liquids we're going to see like gasoline, uh, kerosene, lighter fluid, um, medium petroleum distillates, uh, copier, liquid copier fluids, all have a series of compounds that we have to be able to separate. The patterns are somewhat different, so we can do that. Gasoline doesn't appear the same as a medium or heavy petroleum distillate or light petroleum distillate, so we can tell them apart. Now, we can't tell you what brand gasoline we found, found in the sample because most gasolines are very similar in their makeup. It comes off a, a column by the manufacturer and they have a, uh, it's the same. The only difference is additives but those additives aren't detectable with, by us to where we can tell one brand from another. So we'll look at the printout and make a comparison from a question to a, to a, a known. So the top shows the question sample, the bottom the known. And you can see that the peaks line up. Now unlike doing a drug analysis, they're usually looking for one peak because something like cocaine or heroin comes off as one peak and it has a particular mass spectra. With these, because we have so many compounds, each of these peaks represent a compound, we have to look at patterns. So within the total ion chromatogram, we break it down into our alkanes, which is our straight chain hydrocarbons, our aromatics, which have benzene rings added in, our cycloalkanes would be um, hydrocarbons with that aren't straight. They're they're in a uh, in a circle or some form, but they don't have they're not benzene rings. Um, then we have naphthalenes and a couple others. <laughs> um, there there we go. Uh, indines, styrenes, uh, even aromatics in an even profile and some terpenes. Now because a lot of our fire debris has wood in it we often will see terpenes which is turpentine. Um, but we can tell that it's from the matrix by looking at the sample. So once we've made the comparison and see that the peaks are lining up we have the same pattern in all the different um, profiles we can make a call. And this particular one happens to be a Coleman camp fuel which is a heavy petroleum distillate. So at the Bridgeport lab we went over the disciplines of footwear and tire track and the um, physical matches and the arson analysis. But the trace unit as I mentioned earlier has the largest number of sublist disciplines. So footwear and tire tracks and 
arson, they're subdisciplines, but there's things like glass, paint, fibers, um, rubber analysis, um, lacrimeter analysis, which is looking at uh, presence for tear gas. So there's, there's probably about 20 different subdisciplines in the trace unit. Since we only do those four that I mentioned earlier, the stuff we get in from agencies in these other areas are sent to one of our other laboratories in the state, either Lansing, Grand Rapids, or Northville. From there, they'll analyze the evidence and then send it back and then we return it to the agency. We do here have security where almost all our processing areas and rooms remain closed and locked when someone's not in them working. Uh, that's to protect the evidence from contamination and from loss or theft or anything like that. We are a secure building. So after we get done processing a case, if we made an identification or if we've made a conclusion, we author a report that goes to the agency. That report is then used in court and if we have to testify, we will go in and testify to that report. So when we finish processing the evidence, it's sealed back up. It gets our tape with our initials and date and placed in the property room to be returned to the agency. So when we get to court and we get the evidence handed to us, we can tell if it's still in the same condition by our seal with our name, our initials, and date on it. And we will often have to open the package in court and show the jury what we seen or what we found on that evidence. Hi, my name is Todd Welch. I'm a detective sergeant assigned to the question document unit here at the Bridgeport Crime Lab. I've been in the department for approximately 27 years. About 22 of those years I've been in the question document unit doing forensic examinations on any type of documentary evidence. Essentially any evidence that conveys a message is considered a question document and when it becomes in question or when it's in question it's just being disputed. So in the question document unit we examine documents for either content or authenticity. Uh, Probably the bulk of our work, probably 70 to 80 percent, involves the comparison of handwriting. Uh, we can positively identify uh, individuals by their writing, printing, uh, their signature, cursive. Uh, we also uh, authenticate documents, whether they're counterfeits uh, documents and they want to know whether they're legitimate. Uh, we do those types of examinations. Again, probably 70% of our work involves handwriting comparisons. The other 30% involve all different types of, types of examinations uh, regarding content or authenticity. They can include the comparisons or differentiation of inks, uh, papers. We could do comparative analysis of typewriters and typewriter ribbons regarding typing. We can compare and examine question text to determine if it was copied uh, or printed on a particular printer or copier. We can look at printing processes to determine if documents were produced on one machine as opposed to a document where maybe two or three pages were removed, substituted, and reprinted with a different printing device. We receive evidence that comes into the crime lab uh, up front. Uh, we service every federal, state, uh, local municipality and county agency in the state of Michigan. Uh, any of those agencies that have a case involving documentary evidence, they'll bring into the crime lab here. If it's a document case, obviously they're gonna assign it to the question document unit. And all of the work that we do within the question document unit is non-destructive for other uh, forensic processing. So we ask law enforcement agencies to always submit uh, any documentary evidence to the question document unit first uh, because again anything that we do we're not going to destroy it for 
latent prints if they need latent print work or DNA processing if they need that type of analysis. Um, so all of those cases come into the lab, they are received up front and our administrative staff will determine, you know, of course, or let the agency know that it needs to come to our unit first. So once we receive the evidence uh, into the lab, uh, I'll open up the evidence. Any evidence we receive is sealed. Uh, so there's a, a significant uh, chain of custody involving the evidence, a secure, what we call a secure chain of custody. Um, I'll examine the documents and when I'm done ex with my examinations, I'll s properly seal them up according to our policies and procedures and our accreditation requirements. And then place the evidence back into the property room where it is returned to the agency either when they come in or whether it's mailed back to a particular agency. Okay, involving court testimony, um, in the event, it's not very often that uh, uh, examiners within the forensic document unit testify. However, when we do, we give expert testimony regarding our particular findings, uh, whether it's for the prosecution and on the rare occasion, uh, we have had defense attorneys call us as um, to testify on behalf of their client. Hello, I'm Detective Sergeant Jim Horn, with, assigned to the firearms unit here at the Bridgeport Crime Lab. Um, been here for approximately just over two years. Prior to that, I was assigned to the Tri-City Post, Carroll Post, Thumb Narcotics Unit. Uh, since 1996, when I first entered the department, um, a couple of years after that, I became a firearms instructor. I'm also a departmental um, armor for our weapon systems that we carry um, on duty. Today, we'll be shooting a couple of the test shots inside of our tank. It's a water tank. And what that does is it protects the bullet from any damage other than what's going to be imparted on um, the lands and grooves by the barrel of that, that pistol so that we can compare that to any other evidence that we may have. We're firing a 9mm uh, Ruger uh, P95, it's a semi-automatic pistol and we're going to fire our, our reference ammunition which is a center fire 147 grain full metal jacket bullet um, into the tank. We do have a, well we still have to be in here, but we have a remote uh, firing mechanism that we had actually put it inside this press and trigger it with air and it would fire it remotely. Um, we've had that happen occasionally um, with some of the guns that are uh, a lot of them, they won't even have a slide attached. They'll just have a piece of sheet metal over top of it and a, and a nail uh, on a spring. We're not going to fire those by ourselves. We're going to use that remote firing mechanism. So most of the time this brass catcher is going to catch the brass that's fired so that we can make sure that the only marks that are imparted on the brass are from the firearm itself and that, that we're not going to step on them, roll on them. And so that we have a very good uh, firing pin impression of breech face uh, marks as well as chamber marks that are going to leave this, the marks upon the brass on the outside of it. And then from there we'll go inside the tank and collect the bullets. And so what we have left from the bullets are our two pristine fired bullets out of the barrel of that evidence gun so that we can later observe the lands and grooves left on them by that barrel, which is very unique to that barrel.
So, as you'd seen previously, the test shots that we took in the water tank, we then take those test shots and we put them on the comparison microscope. And the comparison microscope is nothing more than, than two compound microscopes connected together with an optical bridge. An optical bridge is what we're going to look through so that we can see each item at the same time and compare them. And as you can see from the screen, I have both of them up there and we can see a lot of the same individual characteristics left behind about what we call as the firing pin aperture shear, and which is aperture is nothing more than a fancy word for hole. So the hole that the firing pin comes out of that strikes the, the primer or the center piece of that, that cartridge is gonna leave an impression. That firing pin hits that, begins that chain reaction, that small explosion that then ignites the powder that is super hot, creates all the gases that propels that bullet through that barrel um, and imparts all those marks on that bullet that are left behind by the manufacturer. Also what's left behind by the manufacturer are the breech face marks. So every time that a tool is made, tools make that tool and they're constantly changing it during the manufacturing process. So that firing pin has individual marks that you'll see inside the firing pin itself and the firing pin impression, as well as when that, that hole was drilled out by that manufacturer and then later um, they will take a tool and scrape and make that breech face where that, that cartridge head is going to sit up against. So as that cartridge is fired, you're talking uh, approximately between 50 and 60,000 pounds per square inch of pressure coming back and hitting that breech face. So it's going to leave any marks um, left behind on top of that that cartridge case head. We're going to compare these two and make sure that how well they look and how well they they marked. If they didn't mark really well we can obviously as we talked before guns aren't always well taken care of so we can we can clean off those breech face marks make sure that there's any debris, dirt, um, and then refire those and make sure that we actually got some some good marking evidence. Uh, for later when they go into the National Integrated Ballistic System. Um, so right off the bat when I look at cartridge cases I, I want to make sure that I orient myself, uh, put the firing pin aperture shears always to the, the same side which is off to the left on the screen and then look around and see which marks are being repeated. Um, as we can see this one marked very well um, not only at the aperture shear, but Mr. also Cole some of the other uh, breach face marks. And from there, if we did have actual evidence from a crime scene, um, we would bring that in at this time and, and put that in against the, one of the test shots and compare that. We would then have the ability to take photographs of that, um, save those to like a, such as a PowerPoint and save that for our report and also for court purposes. The Michigan State Police Bridgeport Laboratory has scientists who are trained to process crime scenes, including homicides. They process an average of around 50 to 60 homicide scenes a year for the 3rd District of the Michigan uh, state police, which includes 12 counties in the Saginaw Bay region. The crime scene trailer is filled with all the things that a crime scene analyst would need to process a scene in their discipline. The Michigan State Police sends a crew out. They essentially send someone from each scientific discipline that's necessary. For instance, if they had a shooting homicide at a house, they might send a firearms examiner, a latent print examiner, a biologist, and then someone to take notes and do photo documentation. Each of the individuals is trained in addition to their bench duties inside the laboratory to do this job. Well everyone, I hope you had a great time touring the Michigan State Police Bridgeport Forensic Science Lab today. And I hope you had a good time meeting some of the forensic scientists that work here on your behalf. I'm Ryan Larrison, the Lab Director of the Michigan State Police Bridgeport Lab, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks. Mm -hmm.